would like to take this opportunity to welcome everyone to our Autodesk Eagle webinar series. Today, we're going to be talking about using the Autodesk Eagle libraries to create your own components. A few weeks ago, we actually uh, did one that was very similar, but on that webinar, we spoke more about examples of how to map using the Eagle Library Editor, how to assign 3D models to your footprints. Okay, that, That's what we did a few weeks ago. This time, we're actually going to be working by creating a, co a component, and the examples that we're going to be utilizing are going to be based on components that are not possible to be made yet using our package calculator. Okay, so we're going to be using components that most probably are not compliant or IPC compliant to build a part. So usually you see me uh, on the forums, um, usually everybody calls me Ed. Um, and Jorge Garcia, which is another one of our support specialists, will be doing our live demos today. Jorge is very well known to be actively participating on our Eagle forums. I'd like to also invite you to our next webinar which is going to be on August 9th. And this is actually a really, really good topic, manual routing. You know, Eagle does have an outer router, but manual routing is actually um, the preferred method by many engineers to actually take control of their board. Okay? So the registration link will be appearing on the Eagle homepage. It should be appearing most probably today or by tomorrow. And that's going to be on August 9th. So I strongly advise you to join us because we're going to go ahead and feature the new quick route, push and shove uh, routing, uh, loop off, loop on, and other methods that could be used with the new manual routing tools that have been added to Autodesk Eagle. Now today, I want to just go through some brief slides and let you know a little bit about the Eagle Library as a platform. Also, I'm just going to do a little review on the package editor, the symbol editor, and the device editor. And we'll do our best to keep this within our 30 minute time limit, which is what we're gonna actually do. Okay, first of all, let me explain what exactly is the library editor about. It's basically three platforms. It's three editors in one, in one platform. One of them is the symbol editor, and then we have our footprint editor, and the final step, is called our device editor. Let's break that down one by one. First of all, the schematic symbol editor, as you already know, is actually a logical representation of the actual footprint that appears on the circuit board. Big tip here, do not change the default grid when you're placing your pins. I cannot stress that enough. If you actually uh, change the grid to place your pins, there's a good chance that when you start using the schematic symbol in your on your schematic you will not be able to connect to it it will appear that it's connected but when you move over to the board it's not connected so when it comes to the pin placement please please use the point one inch grid I cannot stress that enough okay now do not um, uh, do not uh, confuse the schematic symbol and the package editor, because the schematic symbol does not have to follow the component uh, measurement criteria, like pitch, uh, uh, the pitch between the leads or, or anything like that. It's not necessary when it comes to the representation. So make sure that you're placing your pins, that you are placing your pins on the, on the correct grid. Now, you could go ahead and create your outline for your symbol Use the pin command to place your pins, name your pins, give it a direction, assign them a length as well as a function. And the final stage, it doesn't have to be the final stage, is actually creating your name and your value attributes. The next stage is our footprint editor. I have to update this slide, Jorge, because I'm using package editor and we've already changed the name to footprint editor. Oh. On the footprint editor is actually where you're going to work with the actual measurements the physical aspects of the component okay it's actually the physical component okay so here you're going to be taking into consideration your, your actual pad size if it's through hole component if it's a surface mount component 
the actual drill hole size of the component uh, of the pads, the lead spacing, that's maybe the, the, the highest criteria, is the spacing between both components, uh, not between both components, but between the, both leads or each lead as well. Now, an optional here that I just wanted to mention, and I don't know we're going to be able to have time to go into this, but it comes up every now and then about arbitrary pad shapes. In other words, you may have a component that just has a pad shape, which is not regular. What do I do? And I don't think we'll be able to do it this time, but next month we'll actually, uh, we'll, we'll go into that one more. But just to let you know, you could always email us at support.evo at autodesk.com in case you're creating a component that has an irregular pad shape. But basically what you do is that you place a regular pad down and use the polygon command to draw the polygon of the necessary shape to match the arbitrary pad shape that you need. Okay, so I've introduced the platform for the symbol, I'm sorry, the editor for the symbol, the footprint editor, and now we put it all together on the device level. At the device level, I actually select my schematic symbol, I select my footprint, and then I use the connect command to associate each pin of the schematic symbol to one of the pads. Now, hence, it's possible to assign more than one pin. I'm sorry, it, it's possible to assign multiple pads, round pads. You don't have to use 10 pins. You use one pin and assign those 10 pads to that one pin. You know, I think it's a good time that we go now live with Eagle and have Jorge do some demonstrations for us to teach you the appropriate techniques, how to read the spec sheets and be able to build your own part. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my monitor and pass this on over to Jorge. Give me one moment and I'll do that process. In the meantime, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, I'll be manning the chat as well as the Q&A um, I'll try my best to be as fast as possible, okay? All right, let me know if you have control. Okay, looks good. I'll go ahead and mute myself in the meantime. Okay. So everyone, thank you for again for coming to our webinar. As you can see, this is a data sheet of the part we're going to be making. We're going to be making this USB connector. It's nothing that the package generator can currently do. Also, it's, as you can see, it's, it's a non-trivial part. It's not something really easy like a resistor or something like that. Um, basically, the idea here is that if we make a hard part, then making easier parts should really be a breeze, you know? If I teach you to count to 20, I don't have to teach you to count to 10, 11, 12, 13, or anything like that. Because it, it, it kind of comes with the territory. So what we're going to do is, this is the part we're going to make. I sent the link through the chat. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Uh, confirm if, if, if you can. So you can follow along with this data sheet. And as we go, I won't be jumping back and forth. I do have a printed out copy here with me. And I made already some annotations on it. But there's a couple of things to note about this particular part that we're going to make. Um, first off, there's no standard format for data sheets. Every manufacturer dimensions and marks up the part drawing in their own way. So sometimes you'll get something really nice, sometimes you'll get something a bit more cumbersome to use. This one, I would say, is kind of in the middle. On the bright side, you have the lines of symmetry, which you can see here. And in general, you always want to have your packages centered around the origin and eagle. So these are going to make that very easy. On the downside, they're not leveraging the symmetry when they dimension the design. So what you could, or what would be easier, would be just to dimension off of the center lines, knowing that the opposite side is going to be the same thing, just in the negative axis. Um, so using this one, we're going to have to do a little bit of math to calculate the location of some of these. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and start in Eagle right now with the library design. And then at the end, I'm gonna just make a few a few notes about libraries in general and how the system works in Eagle now. So file, we go new, library. 
This is our new library. The concern in this webinar is not going to be so much to make it manage. We did analyze that in the last one. Um, we're really going to focus on just the drawing and, and the catting of the, of the part. So let's start with the footprint. I'll go ahead and name the footprint what this uh, manufacturer's part number is. Okay, I'll put an underscore USB to make it clear. Say okay, free deep footprint. I'm going to say yes. Okay, we have a description field here, and here's our drawing area. As you can see, there's our origin, 0, 0. Now, one thing that we want to do is we want to try to pick a grid that makes it easier to draw. If you have a good grid, you can freehand a lot of things, and that can make it easier to, to place the paths in the right spots. So let's go ahead and take another look at the data sheet. And if we see all of the measurements are in millimeters, as indicated here, okay, and everything is basically a multiple of 0 0.05 millimeters. So that seems like a good grid size to use for this application. So we'll start with that. I'll go ahead and go back to Eagle River Library. I will adjust my grid to millimeters. And I'll set it to be 0 0.05. And I'll set the alternate to be half of that. Now, what you set the alternate to is very much personal preference, as is the normal grid size as well. Um, but if you know if you're judicious about how you pick your grid size, you can really make life a lot easier. Okay, so now we have a much tighter grid as you guys can see. And what we're going to do is, using the, the data sheet, we're going to calculate the locations of the parts. So, of the pads, sorry. So again, use symmetry to your advantage. If you calculate the right side, the left side is all the same locations, just with negative numbers in the x direction okay so it really is going to minimize how much you have to calculate if you take advantage of the symmetry so to figure out where this pad is located as you know in eagle all the references are the centers of pads but in this data sheet everything is documented to edges so to be able to place things accurately we have to do some math to figure out where the centers are so starting here with this one very simply we take half of 4.3, okay, because we're starting from the zero to the right, half of 4.3, okay. We subtract this little white space here, which is going to be 0 0.25 because it's half of that gap there. Okay, so now we're at 2.15. We subtract the 0 0.25, and we get the dimension or, or the length of this this uh, SMD pad. Again, we divide that by 2 to get the center, and then we tack on this little gap here. And all of that basically takes us to find that the center of this pad is 1.2. Since it lies on the, on the center line of the part, this is going to be the 0. So the location for this pad is 1.2, 0. So let's go ahead and, and get that. Bear with me one second. I'm going to go back to Eagle now. I'm going to click on SMD. And here we specify the sizes of the pads. Okay, so let's go ahead and figure that out. From the data sheet, again, looking at it, we know that its height is 1.9 millimeters. So I can put that here. And from before we had 2.15 minus 0 0.25, we see that that is also 1.9. So this is a very nice square 1.9 by 1.9 millimeter pad. Hit enter. And now you're going to see that the pad will change as soon as I hit enter. There's our new pad. So again, we always have the coordinates here. We can follow along. So you go to 0, sorry, to 1.2. And we make sure that we stay at zero. So 1.2, there we are. We place it, there's the first one. Now, because of symmetry, the next one is on negative 1.20. And you get that one automatically without any type of calculation. 
okay, just from the virtual center. Same thing now for the outside ones, it's the same process. That one works out to be a 3.75 zero. So we'll go ahead and, there you go, 3.75. Now the other one is negative 3.75. Make sure you're at zero for the height, okay. So as I, so as I said, if, if we pick a good grid, I don't have to be typing points here. I could type points and locate them that way. But by picking a good grid, I can kind of freehand and just follow the coordinates. And that's a little bit more efficient. So now, what we're going to do is we're going to go back to the data sheet over here. And we're going to put in these. Okay. So again, the, so the height of this is pretty easy to figure out. It's 1.6 millimeters. The width, we have to figure out by basically taking 8.3. Subtract it from 4.1. That's going to give us the width of two of them divided by two to get the single width. That works out to be 2.1 millimeters. So these pads are 2.1 by 1.6. So we'll go back to Eagle. Notice that the pad command is still active, the SMD pad. So I can just go 2.1 by 1.6. Let me hit enter. And there we are. Okay, so this one, again from, from calculating, if you notice the dimensions we're given, we're given to the top edge of these pads. So we take that top edge to get the height, which is 3.35 from the center line, and we subtract half of the pad height. That's going to give us uh, 2.55 for the height. And then again, using the same processes as before, Knowing now that our pad is 2.1, we can just subtract 1.05 from half of 8.3 to get the, the location on the top right. So again, real simple. What we can do now is we can go ahead and place it at that 3.1, 2.55 location. So we're going to move this. So we go 3.55. 2.1, whoops, got it backwards. It's 3.55 by 2.55. Point 0.1, 2.55. Almost there. And again, we do the same thing over here. 3.1255. So doing it symmetrically makes things a lot easier. And that's the way we, we encourage you to do it. So the only thing remaining pad-wise is going to be the five connections for the for the different USB signals. Okay, and again we have their separations here. What's going to be really nice about these is that the middle pin is again on the center line. So we know that its x coordinate is going to be zero. All we have to do is figure out its height. And again, knowing that it's the top edge of all of them is at 3.35 from the top, you just subtract half of the height to get that center point there. And that works out to be 2.675. So what we'll do, we'll go back to Eagle. We put in the dimensions of the uh, of this SMD pad, and this one's actually pretty nice because this one is fully um, specified without having to do any calculus. So it's 0 0.4, as you can see on the on pin five, it, it gives you the the thickness of the SMD pad, and then its height is all the way on the far left as 1.35 millimeters. So we're there, 1.35. We hit enter. Now we have the nice little skinny. So what we'll do is, again, we'll locate this. Now this one we're going to have to be a bit more careful with. Because this one needs to be at 2.65, uh, 675. So this one doesn't line up as nice on grid. But we did set up the alternate grid. And we can use that to make our lives a little bit easier. So if I hold down Alt, keep an eye on the command line, uh, right here on the command line. Okay, so it gives us that. I hold Alt. And you can see 
and now I can move the appropriate amount. So I want to make sure I stay at zero. And just yeah, right there, it's very, yeah, 2.6500, zero, zero, perfect, place it, and now we have that one done. For the others, it's going to be basically the same idea. So the next ones are spaced 2.6 millimeters apart, so it's 1.3 on one side, 1.3 on the other. And again, these are nice because they're being dimensioned off the center line. So it's a lot easier. So we go to 1.3. I'm looking at the wrong one. Whoops. Yeah, looking at the wrong one. So it's actually uh, 0 0.65. Although 1.3 is used later. So I can just take it all the way to 1.3. There we are. I'll can bump that up to a hair. Perfect. We do the same thing over here. Negative 1.3. And now these are going to be 0.65. And then again, the right height. Perfect. And this one again. So now we really have the critical part of, the, of, of making the, the footprint. It's making sure that all of the pads are in the right places. From here on, most of this is going to be gravy. It's going to be extra stuff just to make the part easier to use. Okay? So right now, if we look at the, at the data sheet, here's something that always freaks everybody out. You see that this part has a really complex outline. And a lot of users feel like they have to draw that. No, you don't have to. And, and the reality is, it's not critical to draw where, you know, the full outline because on the silk screen, it'll just kind of get a little messy on the pads. And so you don't need to do all that. What you can do is this line, you probably want to include it. This is an, an overhanging connector. So they show you where the PCB edge should be. What you want to do is you do want to include that in the in the data sheet. I'm sorry, in the in the Eagle Library part, and that's going to be very easy to do because if we notice from the center line, this line is 1.45 millimeters down, and notice that the length isn't specified. It doesn't matter. You just want to have a guide so that when you put this part on your PCB, you can line it up to the edge, and you can make sure that the part won't be too far away from the edge, making it difficult to connect, or that it won't be um, too far in the other direction, and then you may have some issues with the pads being too close to the edge of the board and the board not being manufacturable. So we definitely want to put that in. That's a useful piece of information. So again, we'll go back to Eagle, and we know it's 1.45 millimeters, so we can use the line command. Now, what layer should we use? A lot of users might be inclined to use the dimension layer. Um, the problem with using the dimension layer is that, as you know, Eagle treats it special. It's part of the board outline. So if you do use the dimension layer, you may have to, on your finished board, kind of cut the outline a little bit and basically fit the puzzle there. What I would encourage to do is to use one of the documentation layers. So maybe use document, reference, in our case, we're going to use document. And again, we have everything on grid, and we know that even this, the edge is 1.45, so that'll be on grid as well. So I can just go down 1.45 from that center line, which is going to be about here. Okay. And then what I can do is I can start it anywhere. It's just a guide. 
and it won't show up on the Gerbers. This is just a reference point for when I'm laying things out in Eagle. So I'm starting from here. I go across. Make sure I stay at 1.45. Okay. And just for the sake of symmetry, I started at negative 6. I'll finish at positive 6. Make sure I'm at 1.45. So as you guys can see, now we have the edge defined. We have all of our pads properly named. Okay. Now, actually, they have a default name. They're not uh, given names in a way that's going to be helpful for assigning the symbol. So we're going to get to that in a second. What else can, should we add here? So the other thing we can do, like I said, if you want to include an outline, that's up to you. You can use some of these dimensions to make like an extreme. Okay, so we know, for example, that at the extreme it's seven and a half in width, and then its length is uh, five point oh five roughly. Okay, so if you wanted to to draw it, you would just draw a rectangle with those dimensions. I don't feel the need to do it for this particular case, um, but that's your your prerogative as well. And you can just have a rectangle of those dimensions. This is a board that actually uses that connector, as you guys can see here. So I did add a rectangle in mine. Okay, and just for the sake of completeness, let's go ahead and add it in this one too. So we know again from the dimensions, 5.05 .05 is the length of the, if it has a flange, depending on which part you use. If it doesn't, if it does have the flange, it's a little bit longer. If it doesn't, um, then it's a little bit shorter. But I'll go off with the normal numbers, just so we have an idea of what space the part takes up. So again, using the power of symmetry, we can just calculate one corner, and then by changing the signs, we get all the others. So calculating one corner, we know it's half of 7.5 millimeters, because that's the width of the part. So half of 7.5 works out to be... Three point seven five. Okay, so that's one corner, and then its width is five point oh five. So again, half of it. I'm going to take half of that. So five point oh five divided by two comes out to two point five two five. Okay, and you're going to see how easy this is. So this one, you would probably want to include on a silkscreen layer. So for this one, we'll go ahead and pick T place. That's the one for all of your of your component silkscreens. So I'll go ahead and put that. I am going to use the command line for this. So press Control L to have access. And now we can just enter points. Okay, so we're going to start from the top right corner. 3.75, 5, uh, sorry, 2.525. Then just change the sign of the X, and now you're moving towards the left. Negative 3.75, 2.525. Now they're both going to be negative, and you're basically going counterclockwise. 3.75, negative 2.525. Now we go positive on the x coordinates. So it's 3.75, negative 2.525. And you should always close it. So you want to end at the same point you started 3.75, 2.525. Okay, and if I did it right, you should get a rectangle out of this. So again, I hit enter, and there it is. So that right there gives you an idea of the dimensions of the part and where everything kind of is. Okay, and that can usually be enough for like an assembly drawing. This would be sufficient. Now, you may be concerned with the fact that the colors are similar. Remember that in Eagle, because of the, the number of colors that we have in our palette, there are layers that share the same color. That's okay. 
the key point is if you do an info, you should see that the layers are different. Because when you go to Gerber, document isn't included, but this one is. Okay, T place it is. So we have that done, that part's wall. Now let's go ahead and name these. So looking at the at the data sheet, we want to name them in such a way that it'll be it'll be easy to match up functionality with the pin numbers. So if we go over to the data sheet, you're gonna see here that it tells you pin one is on the left, pin five is on the right. Obviously in the middle you go one, two, three, four, five. So we go back to Eagle. We're going to use the name command. It's this one right here. So we click this one, we know this is one. Change it to one, hit enter, click this one. Press two, hit enter, click this one. Press three, hit enter. Click this one, press four, hit enter. Click this one, press five, hit enter. Okay, and this is really easy because the name command stays active. Now for the others. These are all shield pads, okay? The, the specification here doesn't give them a name. So what we can do is we can just name them arbitrarily. So I'll start here, uh, SH1, I'll call this one SH2, SH3, SH4, SH5, and SH6. Okay, perfect. So we're almost done. The only thing we need to add now, and it's very important to always add this, is the name and value placeholders. These are the variables that when you actually use the part, get replaced with the appropriate reference designator and the value of the part. So you could just use a text command over here, put greater than sign name, hit OK, make sure that you're on the names layer, it has to be two names left click to place it. Or, just going to show you a little trick, there's a UOP that ships with Eagle, it's going to be in the example section, and it's called set name value. Okay, so I'll double click it and you'll see that it automatically handles it for you. It will place it on the appropriate layers automatically, so you don't have to worry about getting that wrong. and it'll do it very quickly. After you've run it once, it'll show up in the history. So if you right click on the UOP icon, you get a history, and you can just left click to run it again. And this will come in handy as you guys will see shortly. The only thing I like to do with mine is to set the font of these to vector. And the reason for that is that the Gerber standard only recognizes vector fonts. So when you go to Gerber the design, what ends up happening is that if you use proportional font, like this one, the Gerber switches it to, to vector. And there's a difference in width between the two fonts. So like if you have edge near the end of the board, in proportional font, when it goes to vector, it might fly off. So you have to, in my case, I prefer to do it like this. Now the reason it defaults to proportional is that when generating searchable PDFs, Proportional can be searched for, vector cannot, because vector is made up of just a whole bunch of lines. It does not recognize as a proper text object in a PDF. So I'm going to go over here. We can use change command, font, vector, and there we are. Okay. Perfect. So at this point, we could call this done. If you want to get extra fancy, you can go into the description and link to the, uh, to the data sheet. This is HTML compatible. So you can link in images, you can link in data sheets. But we'll leave it here for that. So this has been the creation of the, of the component of the footprint. Um, we'll go ahead and quickly go through the symbol since that's yeah, very trivial. Before you, before you go, mm -hmm. somebody um, stated that, you know, you can't replace the part and it's going to be a line limitation or a line mark. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that's possible. We're going to use it. But, you know, in this example, we're trying to do Well, also, the, the other issue is that if you notice, there's no icon for a line in the library editor, even though you can, I believe, call it from the command line, there is no icon. So from a tutorial's perspective, I would prefer to be able to go to an icon. That's why I didn't go to it. 
Um, but definitely it is something I want to see as an icon in the library editor because it is going to be useful. Because just as you said, I can set them up and just align them all to, to be on the same line. So I totally agree with it. And that's a good suggestion. This is Mm -hmm. That way, you're not speaking, even though you're aligning it to solve it as well. Yeah. Cool. So, from here, what we're going to do is we're going to go into symbol, create a new one, call it USB, hit OK, yes. And this one's going to be really fast because we're just putting in basically six pins. So, go over here the spot from here and we'll go one I like to put two spaces in between do do you in this regard whatever your standard is feel free to oops of course and the last one just shift it the wrong way okay awesome you need that suggest you need that suggested shift key <laughs> you can tell how much I've used it myself huh Right again, so we draw that. Now we just want to name them properly. And what we'll do is again, we use the name command. This one is VCC. This one is D minus. Just one of the differential pair. This one is D plus. This one is ID. This one is ground. And this one is shield. We can leave it at a search. That's good enough for me. Okay. And again, this one is pretty much ready to go. We just want to put in our text. You notice it'll come in with the last used font, so it's going to come in vector. That's not desirable for this schematic. So again, we can switch it. And it would be very easy to modify this UOP to make it you know, be context aware if it's in the footprint editor or in the or in the symbol editor. Um, but we don't do it because of that uh, that PDF functionality. Uh, we definitely want to have some way for all the fonts to be handled as, as same level citizens. That way we can properly create that split. So just go change font proportional. Da -da, and there we are. Yes, very importante. Always stick to a point one inch grid when working on the schematic or on the symbol editor. With the new pin snapping functionality, it's not as critical as it used to be, um, but it's still a very good rule to follow just because every Eagle schematic made in the last 25 years follows it. So it's going to make it all the components are made to that grid. It's going to make it easier for everything to hook up properly. And if you create UAP, the script files, things like that, it just makes everything easier. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and make the device, and this is the last part. Go to device, uh, put in, again, part number. I could name it something else also. It doesn't have to be the part number, but in this case, it makes sense to do so. So I'll say, okay, create new device, yes. You'll notice that we get this screen. All we have to do first is add in the symbol, USB. Again, try to center it. It's going to make placement easier later. I'm going to bring in the footprint. I can add a local package. I can add from web. I can create a little package generator. In this case, it's going to be local. I'll pick my package. Say OK. Notice variant name is empty. Variant name can be empty on the first package you associate with the device. Every subsequent package you associate needs to have something to distinguish it from the others. Usually, um, it's one or two characters that get tacked on. Similar to what manufacturers do with part numbers that are available in multiple packages, they tack on a couple of letters on the suffix. You say, okay, that's the one I want. Looking good there. Prefix. We can use whatever prefix uh, we like by, conven by convention. I like con for connector. Some people may use USB. Let's go with con for today. Say, okay. Now, value off and on. 
this sometimes creates confusion. If value is set to off, then the value is going to be the device name, and by default it won't be editable. Okay, so that's useful in components like integrated circuits where you don't have values of ohms or microfarads or things like that. Um, in those situations, off can be helpful, that way you don't have to specify a value. If you do have something like a resistor, a capacitor, or an inductor that you want to specify the, uh, the value of, then you set it to on. On, when you set it to on, by default, value is empty, and then you can specify it in the design. So the last thing to do here is to form the connections. So we click connect. And you'll see we have all of our pads here. Pin to pad. So looking again at the data sheet, and from, from previous experience, I know that D plus is pin three, so I can connect that. D minus is pin two. Ground is pin five. ID is pin four. And VCC is pin one. Now what about shield? We have six different shield pads that all connect to the same place. So here's where you can assign multiple pads to a single pin. And there's two main ways to do it. You could do a full selection of all the pads. You can hold shift, click here, they're all selected, and hit connect. And you'll see that they all show up here. That's one option. The other option is connect one and then tack on to the latest connection by just hitting a pen multiple times. Okay, those are the two options. Depending on how uh, the pads get arranged, one option may be favorable compared to the other. Like if, they, if, if, the, if the names are such that they don't line up alphabetically, then a pen may be the better way to go instead of doing you know, the hold, shift, and connect. So here we have all the connections defined. Now there's something I want to call your attention to. You notice that when you have multiple pads assigned to, to a single pin, you can break down the connection, so you can always disconnect individual pins. And you have this little icon here. If you hover over the icon, it says all. When you see this icon and it says all, what it means is that all of the pads that are assigned to that pin must connect to the signal. So every single one of these needs to be able to reach the shield connection. Okay. There are components where these pads are internally connected and the data sheet will say as long as you connect to one of them, then the connection is satisfied. In those situations, you click here and you'll see that it will change. The icon is slightly different and now it says any. Any is that situation where they're internally connected and as long as you connect to one of them, then the net list will be satisfied. For this type of component and for signal integrity, I want all of them to connect. So again, take a good look. You'll notice there's a very subtle difference in the icon. One of them has a little bar connecting the two pads. The all, uh, sorry, any doesn't have it, all has it. And now we say OK. OK, so this device is complete. In description again, you can put a link to the data sheet. You can put in images. You can do whatever documentation you want to have for this, OK? And that's basically it. This is the, the creation of a part from scratch. So a couple of things to note here um, and questions. Feel free to make any questions that you guys want to have. A couple of things to note here, OK? This right now is a normal Eagle library. It's not managed, OK? So if you've used Eagle before, this is what you're used to. Now the managed library concept basically allows you to take your library, push it to the cloud. That allows for easier integration with Fusion 360. In the future, it's also going to allow complete control over sharing your libraries. So you can share them among a team. You can share them uh, publicly with everyone, every Eagle user if you wish. The other benefit that this gives is that you get version control on every single asset in the library. Even if you use GitHub, you will only have version control on the library itself. Because in Eagle, in Eagle the, the atomic unit is the library. But when you push to the cloud, when you push to, to the Fusion Team cloud, 
every single asset can be versioned. The symbol, the footprint, the 3D models. So you can see very, uh, with a great deal of detail, every change that a footprint or a symbol or a 3D package is in a drawing, which is something that you can't do with the normal manage library. Now, when it comes to Eagle itself, the idea is that this, this distinction is transparent. But it, if you go into it, if you need to go into the nitty gritty details, what ends up happening is that when you make a managed library, the original library is by default archived, so that way it's not interfering in the users. It gets uploaded, and then once the library is managed, Eagle downloads it and stores it in a special location within its directories. Okay, so what's going to happen is from the Eagle control panel, you'll see all your managed libraries and they'll be easy to access. But if you try to look for them on your system, you're going to find that they're in a deep location within Eagle itself. And that's simply to have better control of them and be able to keep track of the versions. If you see the word managed, then it's obvious it's a managed library. If you see a reference to a URN, a unique random number, then that's also going to let you know that you're dealing with a managed library. Outside of those details, they behave the same within Eagle. Okay, so that's it. For those of you who are trying to wrap your head around what managed libraries are, it's an Eagle library that you've uploaded to the cloud. Once it gets processed on the cloud, gets versioned, gets its URN, its unique random number. Eagle downloads it again and puts it in a special place within its installation directory. At that point, it appears in the control panel. You can open it to edit it. You can make changes. You can use it like any other library. Um, but the added benefits are that now every asset is versioned. In the future, you're going to be able to really precisely control the sharing of your library. And it gives you a good tight link into Fusion 360. Okay. Any questions? Yeah, for some more details on that, you know, just join us on the next um, webinar about libraries, which is going to be somewhere in the mid-August. We'll be um, doing that that webinar about managed libraries and 3D models and so forth, and you'll be able to see. I'd like to make a small announcement before I go into the questions also is that uh, library.io, now uh, you're able to upload your Altium as well as your ORCAD libraries, and it will convert them for you to the Eagle format. And actually, we've been able to test it. It actually works fairly well. So I just wanted to make sure that you know that, know that uh, Altium libraries as well as ORCID libraries are converted. And actually, we'll convert uh, the library uh, schematic symbol package and the device. It actually does a very good job. So just wanted to give you a heads up on that. Now, Jorge, we actually do have one question. And I, I know the answer, but, um, but you may have some trick, which is actually kind of nice. But... He's asking, you know, he like to make lines up with a fixed angle. Let's say he would like to, you know, uh, do a line on respect of 120 degrees in respect of the horizontal grid line. Um, he says that he has to do these, but he actually has to put a lot of math into it mm -hmm. to be able to do it. And I understand why, because we don't really, you know, can specify it. Do you have any tricks on, along the lines of that? So we, if we can address that one later, because we have a few going further back up in there. We have like Absolutely. 12. Uh, question, what can you totally scrap the existing editor and go with something like the sketch editor and saw for Fusion 360? <laughs> so what ends up happening here is definitely agree that the drawing tools should be better, but SOLIDWORKS and Fusion 360 don't provide the netless information, the connectivity information that the Eagle editor currently provides. So what we would want to do and what we're interested in doing is incorporating those drawing tools, those more sophisticated drawing tools into Eagle to make this easier. That way you don't have to do the calculator thing. But for now, we're, we're at the calculator. You know, that, yeah, I guess, you know, that, that's the difference between, you know, being an ECAD application versus being a mechanical application. You know, it's extremely different, uh, the whole mindset. But yeah, we're, we're, we're doing some really good improvements in that direction. And you know, you'll see more and more uh, the package calculator will come in very, very useful. But we wanted to do a webinar in this aspect. That way you could see how, you know, the, the raw way of actually creating a component from uh, without basically no aid at all as well. I've, I've been able to take care of some of the questions. Yeah, I noticed you did. <laughs> so uh, there's one here. Is it desirable to design a symbol to look more like a USB connector instead of a general connector? 
Um, that's a matter of taste. It depends on on how you how you want your schematic to read. Some people do like it to look a little bit more, um, more like the USB connector. Obviously, not a perfect representation of it, but something more indicative of a USB connector. Um, I myself, I'm kind of kind of old school, and, and I'm not too big into aesthetics, so I'm I'm perfectly happy to have a rectangle. But if I worked for somebody else and, and they specified a standard, then I'll conform to that. Yeah, it's a matter of preference. Um, I myself, I think I would like to make it happen, um, make it look like it. But I would actually go with something easier just because I just want to make the part of the use it. So. Yeah. <laughs> it all depends on how much time you have to do that. <laughs> so when creating the component, place the outline on the T-place layer, cause the silk screen to cross several of the pads. Won't this create errors in the DRC when using this part? So it'll create warnings. The reality is when it comes time to manufacture, these pads are big enough that as soon as solder hits, it will burn off the silk screen. Also, many manufacturers automatically correct the silk screen to avoid overlapping pads. So it becomes a non-issue. With more time, I would have cut them out and cleaned it up a bit more. Um, but we're, we're already going almost into the hour, so I didn't want to take that extra time. This, as it stands now, would be manufacturable. And like I said, most uh, manufacturers would take it out. And even if they didn't, as soon as solder hit the ink, the ink would, would, uh, would evaporate off. So is there a way in Eagle PCB Editor to make lines with a fixed angle? A line with 120 points. You know, before we go there, I just wanted to bring up really quick that when you're in the device editor, as many of you noticed that he did the add command to bring in the schematic symbol. Um, if you created a multi-gated component, you would just continue using the add command to add more parts. If it was a multi-gated component. Also, we were talking about the variant. I wanted to bring that up because I'm not sure if everybody's aware that you could have multiple variants. In other words, you could have one schematic symbol and several footprints for that symbol. That way you're able to switch when you're on the board. Uh, editor, you could switch between one of the variants as well. And that, I know you brought that up, but I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. That's okay. Yeah, let's go ahead and take care of the 120, 120 degrees. degrees. So right now, the best way to handle that, Luis, is basically to use polar coordinates. Is how I would handle it. So what you can do is you can, let me see if I can show you. I'll show you in, in a board to not mess with the library. Okay, what you can do is over here. If you notice right now, you have this fixed reference, uh, you know, X, Y, and that's it. If you add a mark, okay, and the mark command is over here, okay, what you're going to do is you're going to add a relative origin. And that relative origin now allows you to specify coordinates in other ways. You can do relative coordinates so now eagle measures relative to this new origin and you can do polar coordinates okay so for example for that 120 degree line what you would do is you would put zero zero sorry r zero zero with the line command active uh, okay, so r zero zero to start it at that origin for example I hit enter and you'll see that now it's going to be at that point I'm going to go ahead and put wire bench out two, which allows it just to be a straight line and then what I'm going to do is put in P for polar put in a length whatever length I want it to be let's say uh, I don't know 200 mils and then put the angle the angle would be 120 Hit enter, and you'll get it right there. Okay? And that would be the easiest way to do it right now. That way you don't have to you don't have to calculate the XY location and put in you know the Cartesian coordinates for that. That's how I would handle getting a 120 degree right now. Uh, again from Carlos's earlier comments, definitely we do need more options on the drawing tools, similar to what you know, mechanical engineers are used to. Um, is there a place? Is there a place slash site to download slash create three D components slash three uh, D component part? Um, best place right now is library.io. 
as time is going on, that will continue to grow. You'll have right now you have access to all of the public libraries there. Um, you can create obviously use the uh, the online package generator can be used there as well. Everything will be linked to your account, so you can download it locally to Eagle. Hopefully that answers everybody's yeah, Just join, join us on, on the next one about libraries. We'll be talking about that topic specifically um, in August, okay? We'll be talking about, you know, hold a 3D model. We'll, we'll mention these, uh, exactly what you're referring to. Okay. Excellent. I don't see any other questions uh, right now coming up. Yeah, well, um, about the custom libraries, did you answer that one already? Or? Which, one? Which one? So, so Klaus is asking, it makes sense, uh, if it makes sense to keep custom libraries in a separate place in the file system that are not missed when updating to a new version. Well, to be honest with you, that's already being done. Yeah, that's um, why we did that whole separation. Yeah. Because, so now what happens is that every time you work on a library or on a custom library or edit any library in the past, it used to be stored in the root folder library of Eagle directly. So every time you did an update, you had to like move your libraries over. With 9.1.1, I think, is when we switched over to the fact that now all of your user-defined files are now stored in the, your documents Eagle folder. Okay, so now when you update anything that you you have custom made, actually will be accessible. You don't have to move it around. Okay, so yeah, so uh, it is a really good idea, and we did something about it already. Okay, so let me see if there's any other questions. I don't see. Will manage library kept when updating to a new version of Eagle? So when you update to a new version of Eagle, what's going to happen is you'll have the option to download it. Um, right now, every new version of Eagle, when you first start it, will recognize that there is an old Eagle RC file available and ask if you want to import it. If you import it, I believe your managed library will automatically download when you do that. Um, but if not, in the new version of Eagle, you just go into the library manager and download them again into the current version. Yeah, and that's the most common scenario right there. Yeah, just go into your manage dive, update or download them again, okay? Which is kind of nice that you don't have to be uh, uh, using Dropbox or using something to, to store your libraries to access them uh, somewhere else. So uh, having the managed library, now you can move on to another computer and you can download them, or if you do an update, you can just actually get them from, from your managed library as well, okay? Okay, so Carlos, we will, and we will continue to work in that direction. <laughs> okay, uh, we, we, we will definitely uh, do that, and that's in the direction we're, we're going in. So yeah, we, we, we will definitely work in that direction. So, uh, well, I think we've covered everything. Um, I don't see any other questions. We went a little bit over uh, our time marker, but you know what? During, throughout the entire presentation, we did not even lose one person. We actually have a nice crowd going on today. Uh, globally and everybody is, is there with us all right I'd like to thank you for uh, doing the presentation as always it's very detailed as well as extremely useful and uh, we will we have recorded this webinar we will be posting it as soon as we can edit it and post it in our YouTube channel we have some other ones that we have done but as you can see we have a new interface so these will be much easier for you to follow along if you need to contact us uh, you can always use support.eagle at autodesk.com. That's support.eagle at autodesk.com. Also, we very often could find us on the Eagle Forum. So if you have any questions or you want to add any comments there, go ahead and do so. We'll try our best to make the announcements.